Welcome to your Canadians Connection on Rocket Sports Radio. We are proud to be the trusted source for all things Habs for more than a decade. This is the Canadians Connection Podcast. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Canadians Connection podcast here on Rocket Sports Radio, keeping you informed, engaged, and entertained. My name is Michael Spinella, and I'll be your host for the next hour. This is episode 277 of the Canadians Connection podcast, and I'm very pleased to be joined in the studio by my co-host, the editor of the Hockey News Montreal, the founder and the president of Rocket Sports, uh, Rick Stevens. And Rick, how are you doing? It's uh, been a couple weeks. Happy New Year. Glad to Happy have you New back Year. in the hosting chair. Yeah, uh, I guess a nice thank you goes off to Amy Johnson for uh, holding down the fort uh, in my absence there, but uh, hoping that uh, you had a nice holiday there. I certainly did, and and uh, we hope that our listeners had a, a great holiday as well. Lots of ha- Habs hockey. Um, and listen, if you've missed our, um, you know, you, you get busy over the holidays, you may have missed uh, a podcast or two. Well, just head over to canadiansconnection.fm and you can check out any of the uh, archived um, episodes that you might have missed. Um, but today we have a pretty comprehensive uh, podcast and we're titling it The Montreal Canadiens Injuries, Depth and Trade Possibilities. Yeah, brand new calendar year. We're in 2024, which is hard to believe, but uh, still some of the same problems that the Montreal Canadiens <laughs> ran into last season, to be completely honest. But uh, on this episode, uh, we'll take you through everything that happened uh, to the Montreal Canadiens in the past week. Nice week in review. We'll also catch up uh, with the prospects. We have the World Juniors coming to an end, so we'll talk about that as well. Plus, just before that, uh, we have some winners and losers for this week. And to end segment one, some news from around the NHL. In segment two, uh, exactly like what we just talked about, depth, injuries, and being competitive. Uh, We'll uh, set the tone for that, and uh, looking forward to discussing a lot of these issues. And then in segment three, uh, we like to turn it over to our listeners. Uh, Our Canadians Connection question of the week is, which Montreal Canadian player would you like to see at the All-Star game? And if uh, anyone is interested in reaching out to us, I know that uh, in the past few weeks, we've had a lot of listener questions, a lot of listener comments. How can uh, all of our listeners reach out to us with all their questions and comments? Well, if you have opinions on the All-Star Game, we know Nixon, well, we'll share that later who's going. But if you want uh, another Canadians player uh, to go to the All-Star Game, you got to vote. Um, but we want you to tell us um, who you would like to see. And you can do that or talk about anything else you want uh, to talk about at 5853-ROCKET. That's our Rocket Sports text line. It's 5853-ROCKET. You can also follow at Habs Connection on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Uh, Make sure that uh, you're following us there. Leave some likes, leave some comments. Send us a DM with all of your uh, questions and comments as well if you'd like. And you can check out our website, canadiansconnection.fm. Make sure that you check out all our pre-game previews and post-game recaps for every Montreal Canadiens game at thn.com slash Montreal. And here's what's gone down since we were last here. If we want to go back in time all the way to December the 30th, uh, Montreal Canadiens visit the Florida Panthers, and it's a losing effort. Florida wins that one 4-1. It was tied 1-1 for both teams after they both scored power play goals in the second period. But Florida would steal the show with a couple of unanswered goals. And, uh, man, uh, offense uh, really struggling for the Habs in that game. Uh, Florida led the shot department to 26-19. Eight shots for the Montreal Canadiens uh, in two periods. After 40 minutes, the Canadiens had eight shots on goal. Uh, the entire game at 5-on-5, five five, they had three high-danger scoring chances. Not going to win many games that way. And um, if that wasn't bad enough, on the penalty kill, the Canadiens were, were just a mess. Uh, the Panthers' power play scored twice on the power play. And the Canadiens, um, at that point, were second worst in the National Hockey League uh, on the penalty kill. And, uh, well, to end things, end the year in Florida, on the 31st of December, uh, Montreal visits the Tampa Bay Lightning, and they lose 4-3. to uh, That's their third straight loss at this point. Uh, Montreal actually had a 2 nothing lead in the second period. Uh, one of those goals, I think, should be nominated for blunder of the year. <laughs> um, 
yeah, uh, I don't understand what happened. Montembeau covered up the puck pretty easily there, but uh, as the ref put the whistle up to his mouth, he did not blow the whistle, uh, and music came on, some lights flashed, and the entire Tampa Bay team, including the goalie, head over to the bench, and uh, I guess Montreal picked up on this. Montembeau, uh, with a little bit of a heads-up play, getting the puck to Kovacevic, who sent it all the way down into the empty net, and it would count. Uh, Someone's going to have to explain this one to me, but... Tampa Bay Lightning were not happy about that, of course, so they stormed back. They tied things up before the third period and then ended up taking the lead and coming away with that 4-3 to three victory. It, bizarre. It, it was absolutely one of the most bizarre goals I've ever seen uh, in hockey. Um, yeah, and do and you remember um, there was all that a few years ago, that controversy about the... the um, referees, the officials, the intent to blow didn't matter. They said it didn't matter um, if the whistle had a, had sounded. It was that they had intended to blow the whistle, and certainly bringing the whistle to your lips means you're going to blow the whistle. But it didn't happen that way. Um, and man, the the crowd was angry um, in Tampa. the The team was angry, and um, Montembeau gave up one of the worst goals of the the season. Austin Watson um, started the, the oh a Braden Point got a goal and then Austin Watson and then it was uh, it was all Tampa Bay. A uh, strange, really strange game. Yeah, honestly, I don't know why the official didn't blow the whistle here. And the fact that the music came on and everything, I I don't understand what happened here. But anyways, the goal will stand, and uh, you'll see that in, uh, I guess, your bloopers of the year recap for uh, the next few months anyway. For sure. Uh, starting the new year off, January the 2nd, uh, Montreal gets a win in Dallas, 4-3, to three, uh, despite being outshot 34-18. to 18. The Habs were actually up 4-1 to one in the third period, and uh, man, they hung on pretty tight uh, to keep that one goal lead at the end. Speaking of high danger scoring chances, the Montreal Canadiens got two in the first period in this game, and then none for the remainder of the game. So that, that tells you just how poor uh, Scott Wedgwood was in net for uh, Dallas. Um, you know, Ottinger's out with uh, an injury, and Wedgwood did not look good. Uh, and fortunately for the for the Canadians, Wedgwood did not look good in this. Um, so the Canadians scored four straight times. Um, they got two more goals by defensemen, uh, a four-one comfortable lead, and uh, then the goalie gets Wedgwood got pulled with about six minutes left, and Dallas went to work. Scored two more times, um, made it close, uh, but the Canadians kind of held on, and they were. It was um, a clinic on uh, Montreal Canadiens, both defensemen and and forwards blocking shots. um, And full credit uh, to to the skaters in front of Sam Montembeau for that one. Absolutely, and a couple of days later, Montreal returned home, where they received a great big spanking by the Buffalo Sabers as the Sabers come away with a six to one victory. Uh, goalie Devin Levi made his debut at the Bell Center in this one. He looked pretty good. Uh, not many positives here to say about the Habs. I mean, they lost 6-1 to one in this one. Armia had the lone goal for them shorthanded. Uh, Tage Thompson looked great for the Sabres, putting up a pair of goals and uh, really leading the offense on uh, the Buffalo end. And uh, the Habs <laughs> killer, um, Jeff Skinner, uh, four-point night, three assists, a goal. Uh, he always seems to pl- play well when the Sabres play the Canadians. Yeah, the, the Montreal Canadiens were not in this game uh, at all, and it was um, a really nice moment for, uh, not a nice moment for the Canadians, but a nice moment for Montreal-born uh, goaltender Devin Levi. Yeah, we'll talk about Devin Levi again uh, towards the end of this segment. Uh, the Canadians' record currently 16-17-5. and five. That's 37 points and 25th in the NHL. Uh, the Habs have a 3.2% chance of making the playoffs and uh, on pace to get to 78 points this season. In roster news, uh, the Canadians announced that Christian Dvorak would undergo season-ending surgery to, report, to repair a torn pectoral muscle on Friday. Uh, he's only suited up for 25 games this season, and uh, that injury came all the way back in December against the Pittsburgh Penguins. Another season-ending injury for a Montreal Canadian and another season-ending injury for Christian uh, Dvorak. Um, unfortunate, um, but uh, you know he's, he's a very versatile player. 
Um, he played on the power play, on a second uh, unit power play, plays on the penalty kill. Um, and we'll talk later about how the Canadians are going to have to adjust uh, to replace him in the lineup. Canadians recalled forward Emil Heineman. Uh, so far this season, he's suited up in two NHL games. He's yet to get the score sheet, but uh, I believe he will be suiting up tonight. Yeah, Emil Heineman will play uh, his first game at the Bell Center uh, against the New York Rangers. Um, the Canadians will go away from the 11-7 where uh, Kovacevic was the uh, seventh defenseman um, that, that worked Mm, um, mm. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Uh, Kova Savage will be a healthy scratch um, against uh, the Rangers. Um, interesting that uh, Heinemann's recall was an emergency recall. Um, and why is that interesting? Well, um, Dvorak hasn't yet been, been placed on uh, injured reserve, and so something's going on there. Uh, he'll be backdated, of course, um, uh, to the date of his injury, December 30th. Um, and so it probably means that Heinemann is up for a short time and that someone is coming back. Yeah, so we'll look out to, uh, for that one for you guys. Uh, talking about Josh Anderson, well, we have a lot to say here. Uh, uh, Josh Anderson. Just, oh, I, we, we do have a lot to say about Josh Anderson, but let's just uh, focus on possibilities of, of who might be coming back. Um, and uh, Tanner Pearson is skating with the team. Um, but Raphael Harvey Pennard, I think is going to be, uh, he skated, um, regular Jersey in formation, um, on Saturday. So he's very close to returning. We may see him as soon as the Philadelphia game this week. Uh, and that would, I think, explain the reason why Heineman was only up on a, an emergency recall. And, and so we may see, uh, Harvey Pennard reactivated off IR, uh, as soon as this week. Yeah, sorry sorry sense. to interrupt. Please, please go ahead with, with Josh Anderson. All right. It is Josh Anderson time now. You can tell I was excited. Absolutely. <laughs> the gut a bit. Uh, but uh, he was almost added to the injury list. Uh, a bit of a scary scene in which he appear, uh, appeared to have maybe injured his knee. But turns out he's okay. Um, we do have some audio from uh, Josh Anderson as well. But uh, I'll get your uh, knowledge on this one, Rick, before we get to that. Yeah, um, it was a rough game for Josh Anderson. Um, blocked a shot in the first period, uh, was was uh, hobbling a bit, um, got that stick to the face, um, and then uh, in the third period left the game and uh, he couldn't put any weight on um, on his leg. He he struggled to get off it. It looked uh, it looked awful. And um, well, let's play the clip from Josh Anderson. I think he was expecting. Um, that it was going to be a serious injury. Yeah, for sure. A uh, little, little bit of a scare. Usually, um, you know, as a player, when those things happen, usually you, you kind of know right away if something's wrong. Um, um, a little stunned going back to the room and then let it calm down. And um, you know, obviously everything was, was good enough from, from there. And um, but Yeah, just the thought of when it, when it happened and the, the feeling, uh, your whole leg goes numb. But uh, yeah, I'm good to go. So his whole leg uh, went numb, he said. Uh, he thought, he said, as a player, and especially a player who's had those kinds of uh, knee injuries before, uh, that he knew, um, at least he thought he knew, um, what it was all about. Uh, but fortunately, uh, he had the, the feeling came back, um, he said, about 10 or 15 minutes later, uh, and um, and he was fine, good to go. Uh, odd situation, but that's the way it played out. Certainly an odd situation, but I have one more question. Uh, Josh, was that your right skate? I think, I think it was my right skate. Yeah, it was kind of hard to, to tell. I it felt like he pushed my knee, and then I um, thought it was like MCL, but I don't know, it was, it was a weird feeling. I think it caught a couple nerves, but yeah, it's fine. Uh, so you were right. It was his right skate that got caught. Um, but you heard him say he thought it was his MCL. Um, and But that, he said, uh, caught a couple of nerves uh, and and it went numb. Um, <laughs> fortunately, uh, it looks like he's no worse for wear and uh, uh, was able to play on Thursday night and again uh, on Saturday. Yeah, and so Josh Anderson uh, dodging a bit of a bullet there. 
But some good news for Josh Anderson is uh, he was named the Molson Cup recipient for the month of December. So if you remember, for the longest time, we were waiting for Josh Anderson's first goal of the season, and uh, he actually had a pretty good uh, month of December. He was first star of the game uh, once uh, on December the 16th against the Islanders, third star on three occasions, December the 4th against Seattle, uh, December 18th in Winnipeg, and the 22nd in Chicago. So in uh, 13 games in December, uh, he led the team with uh, six goals and uh, eight even strength points. So uh, pretty uh, good uh, month of December for Josh Anderson, and nice to see that he's uh, getting back on track at least. Yeah, so there was a ceremony ahead of of the game on Thursday presented with the Molson Cup, um, and great to see him uh, back in the lineup. Will we talk about Josh Anderson again later? Is he possibly on that trade list, asset list that we're preparing? We'll see. Uh, Yeah, uh, I don't know. We'll see. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, but uh, I think on that note, uh, since we did talk about uh, winner, it's time to get to our winners and losers. And now it's time for this week's winners and losers on the Canadians Connection. So this one, uh, we, we were a little bit more collaborative on uh, coming up with our list here uh, more than other weeks. And uh, we'd like to start off with someone that we had as a finalist as a looter, loser. Uh, there was a loser that came in a little bit later that uh, I think beat him out. But Ryan Hartman. <laughs> A bit of a weird situation uh, in a game against uh, the Winnipeg Jets where he high-sticked Cole Perfetti during a face-off and, uh, well, he proceeded to deny it. And uh, what exactly transpired here? Because this this whole situation was just weird. I think they were both mic'd up as well. Yeah, Ryan Hartman, not, you know, he's a living on the edge kind of player. Um, Wanted to retaliate for, for a hit on... Uh, his player and um, his denial was even a little, he he kind of only half denied uh, that it was on purpose, but I don't know. To me, when you're watching the face off, he didn't, he didn't even go for the puck. He went right for the face of, of Perfetti. It was uh, was cheap, dirty, ugly play. I, I thought. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, go and watch the replay on that. It, made no sense at all and I, I believe Hartman ended up coming away with a fine on that one so just kind of a dirty play and uh, retaliation for a player that uh, actually it wasn't even against I, I believe it was Brendan Dillon on the Winnipeg right. Jets that uh, made a hit uh, against Kirill Kaprizov so I, I don't know what uh, Ryan Hartman's doing here so go after you know uh, you heard our young player uh, will go after your best young player I don't know what the thinking was there but um, Hartman and and oddly as egregious as it was, he was only a finalist. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> someone uh, way worse came in, and I think our winner and loser are kind of tied to each other. So the loser, Anton Johansson from Team Sweden of the World Juniors, and the winner, Lane Hudson of Team USA of the World Juniors. Uh, so in the last uh, minute of the gold medal game at the World Junior Championships, uh, Sweden versus USA, uh, Johansson uh, instigated a fight against one Lane Hudson uh, about 30 seconds left in this one. And, uh, well, Lane Hudson actually looked pretty good in this one. Uh, Johansson, not going to lie, seemed a little bit immature during this fight, um, uh, throwing a few punches at uh, Lane Hudson. Uh, Snuggerud came in uh, to uh, Hudson's defense uh, towards the end there. But, uh, man, uh, just a bad look overall for that team Sweden, starting all kinds of ruckus and fights right at the end of a gold medal game. Yeah, it was clear that that they were going to be on the losing side and and in front of their own home fans and uh, just an ugly incident where Johansson um, just started throwing gloved punches to the head of Lane Hudson. Um, And I mean, uh, Johansson is, uh, he's a fourth round pick, I think, of of the Red Wings, Uh, but he's 6'4". 6'4", 195, something like that. Lane Hudson isn't. Uh, let's just say that. There's there's a good six inches uh, difference in height and and maybe 30 pounds in, in weight. Uh, so Johansson was just hammering on, on uh, Hudson's helmet. Uh, as you said, um, somebody came in to help out, and uh, Lane Hudson took a step back and then said, no, I'll take care of my own battles, thank you. Got re-engaged and started firing punches, then grabbed 
Johansson around the head and took him down to the ice uh, for the win, for the takedown, um, and and earned the uh, respect of uh, all of his Team USA teammates. And um, as as they said, um, Hudson's one of the strongest players on the team, um, and he certainly showed it there in his takedown. So we're going to give Lane Hudson uh, the winner of the week. Yeah, all you hear is, oh, Lane Hudson's short. How's that going to translate to the NHL? Well, he just took down one of the biggest guys on Team Sweden, so I I don't (laughs) think I'm really concerned about that anymore. For sure. And uh, talking about the World Juniors, I think it's a good time to get to our prospect update. It's time for the Rocket Report. The Rocket Sports Media team is your premier source for information about the Laval Rocket the AHL affiliate of the Montreal Canadiens, as well as Habs prospects playing in the CHL, NCAA, and leagues around the world. Bookmark THN.com slash Montreal to follow our comprehensive coverage of Canadiens prospects. So each week uh, we like to take a Montreal Canadiens prospect and shine the spotlight on them. And uh, this week we're going to shine the spotlight on uh, Oliver Kapanen. Don't forget about Oliver Kapanen, uh, currently playing in uh, Kalpa in the Liga. Uh, he was a former 64th overall pick by the Montreal Canadiens in uh, 2021, uh, currently sitting on 14 point the points, uh, currently unsigned as well. Uh, so this is a guy that uh, I think we might want to start uh, keeping an eye on. Yeah, you want to uh, um, high second round pick in 2021. Um, he's got some uh, legacy of family blood uh, bloodlines. Uh, the Kapanen name. His his uncle is Sammy Kapanen, former NHLer. Sammy Kapanen. Uh, his cousin Kasperi Kapanen. Um, so you know he's. He, you said he's playing for Kalpa. Um, Twenty six games so far this season. Fourteen points. Uh, but in his last game um, against uh, JYP. Uh, two goals, two assists, four points, a plus three. That was on Friday night and played close to 19 minutes um, in ice time. Uh, he was also involved in the Spengler Cup as as Kalpa was there. Uh, so let's let's not forget about one Oliver uh, Kapanen. Absolutely. And on that note, uh, let's uh, take a look about the world. Take a look at the World Juniors. Uh, that uh, championship just came to an end uh, this past week. Uh, kind of a disappointing result uh, for Team Canada. If uh, I know we have a lot of Canadian listeners as they finished in fifth place. Uh, the medals, uh, gold uh, going to Team USA, silver to Sweden, and bronze going to Czechia. Uh, Montreal had quite a few prospects of this one. And uh, starting off with uh, Team Canada, Owen Beck uh, in five games, one goal, one point, plus two. Uh, he played more of a third-line role, I think, uh, uh, more of your defensively responsible center. I thought he had an all right tournament. Uh, nice to see him get on to that team uh, last year. He was, uh, I guess, more of an extra. He was called on in an, on an emergency basis. So kind of a big deal for uh, Owen Beck to be able to be on that Team Canada. Yeah, he was there in a, um, a leadership role, and I think he provided some some leadership. Um, he wore an A uh, for Canada um, offensively, that's isn't what. That's not why he was there. Um, he he was in the top um, at, at one point. He led the the um, the tournament in faceoff percentage, and I, I think he finished in the top three, um, playing about fourteen minutes a game. So uh, you know he he was there. He had a role. He fulfilled his role. Um, and, um, you know, obviously a very valuable for team Canada and, and valuable, um, in the OHL as well. Um, we know he plays for Peterborough and, and Peterborough, um, you know, they, I think they, they defied expectations, uh, at the beginning of the season and they're coming kind of back down to earth. Uh, they've made uh, a couple of trades already. The OHL trade deadline is January 10th. 10th, I believe. Um, and so, um, we, we've heard, uh, there's speculation, uh, that there's a trade in place just waiting to be announced that will take, um, Owen Beck, uh, from Peterborough to the Saginaw Spirit. Uh, the Saginaw Spirit, um, are, uh, ranked second in the Western division of the OHL. They have a 22-10, 
uh, and won record. And um, the star on that team is six, uh, 16 year old Michael Misha, uh, who um, has 17 goals and 22 assists already. So uh, Beck being likely, will likely hear that trade uh, coming out this week. Um, heading to a a team who has Memorial Cup potential and and certainly will be involved in the OHL playoffs. Uh, so great that will be great experience for Owen Beck. Absolutely. And on Team USA, the gold medal winning team, Montreal had two prospects. Uh, of course, Lane Hudson, who we talked about, uh, he put up six assists, six points, uh, plus eight. And uh, honestly, uh, I think a bit of a highlight for that team. And someone that uh, I know you're a pretty big fan of in uh, Jacob Fowler. Uh, he got into a few games there as well. Uh, he put up a 2.59 goals against average and an 8.89 save percentage. Uh, what were your thoughts on these two? Well, Jacob Fowler first. Um, Trey Augustine was the number one. He was the incumbent. Um, he was he was had the experience from from uh, last season and played in the uh, semifinal and final. Jacob Fowler. Um, you know, this was his, his first year there and got into three games. His numbers are kind of average. He got two wins. Um, but I thought he was really good as, as we mentioned last week, uh, in the shootout win, um, big stage, big moment, big pressure. Uh, and, and he looked uh, pretty good. Lane Hudson, um, tremendous, um, (laughs) absolutely tremendous. Um, he, he was, um, you know, I, I don't think with Lane Hudson, well, he had six points, uh, yeah, six points in the tournament, a plus eight, um, but he was playing, well, he averaged the, in the tournament uh, 24 minutes a game, uh, 25 minutes and 12 seconds in the semifinal, 27 minutes and 20 seconds in the final, um, and was named um, U.S. player of the tournament. And was also involved in the, the media vote and, and whatnot. We'll get to that in, in a few minutes. But um, just, uh, you know, his coach uh, from Denver said that that he was just the guy out there who was calm, who controlled the play, who drove the play. Um, he did everything he was asked you know, to do and a huge part of that USA gold medal. For sure. And one last prospect that made an appearance at the World Juniors is Philippe Michard. Uh, he wore an A on his chest. He got into five games, two goals, seven assists, nine points, and a plus two. Uh, Slovakia, definitely one of the weaker teams finishing in sixth place. But uh, you know what? Philippe Michard was kind of a bright spot on that team. He was great. Played 17 minutes, uh, average 17 minutes a game, um, and one of the, the better players uh, along with Dalibor Dvorsky on uh, on Team Slovakia. And uh, at the conclusion of the World Junior Championships, uh, we wanted to take a look at the all-star team that was selected by the media. In goal, they decided to go with Hugo Havelid from Team Sweden. On defense, uh, Montreal prospect Lane Hudson of Team USA and uh, Theo Lindstein of uh, Team Sweden. On forward, Cutter Goche of USA. I think he had a great tournament, one of my favorite players to watch on USA, actually. Uh, Yuri Kulic uh, of Czechia gets in there as well, and uh, Jonathan Lakiramaki of Team Sweden. Uh, so a lot of players that uh, were from that Slavkovsky draft, it seems, and uh, they all look very good. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, before the, the tournament, um, the Hockey News editors were asked to um, make predictions, and it's tough going into a tournament to, to make those predictions. I was I was one of that group. Um, my final uh, for the gold medal, I predicted USA over Sweden, and that's what happened. Pretty pleased about that. Bronze, well, <laughs> it was Canada over Slovakia, so it was a big miss there. Um, but I uh, was asked to predict the um, the all-star team, and I had uh, Lane Hudson on defense, correct there. Uh, Jonathan Lakaramaki as a forward and Cutter Goche um, uh, as uh, uh, from the USA as another forward. So I got three out of the six. Uh, I don't think any of the hockey news editors selected Hugo Havlid in goal. Um, that was, uh, <laughs> and, and, and I think as we talked before the show, not necessarily, he, he had a good team in front of him, uh, but he's going to be likely be um, taken in the first round, maybe in the first round of the upcoming 2024 NHL draft. 
Uh, goal, I actually thought that uh, Harabal had a very good tournament. Yes. Kind of, that was my goalie standout for sure. Uh, but uh, talking about Team Canada, just for a brief moment, I think you and I agreed that this was not the best Team Canada. Right. Obviously, no Connor Bedard from last year. That makes a huge difference, of course, and not a ton of returning players. So maybe a blip in the radar for Team Canada. I know there was some disappointment and a lot of questions as to why they didn't uh, medal this year. But uh, I think next year it's going to be a much better team. Uh, it's just one of those seasons where uh, a lot of your better players ended up in the NHL this year. Yeah. Uh, let's take a look at uh, the Laval Rocket from this past week. A good week for them, uh, albeit a bit of a lighter week. Only two games uh, going back to December the 30th. Uh, secure, uh, Syracuse comes to visit Laval, and Laval gets the 4-1 to victory. Dobis uh, with a great win. Uh, he looks solid in goal, and uh, Laval goals from all the players that you might want them to come from. So Sean Farrell, Jan Meshack, Arbor Jackai, and uh, Joshua Waugh all get on the score sheet. A uh, couple days off in between uh, before Laval's next game as uh, they headed over to Utica on January the 5th, and they come away with a 4-3 to three victory. Uh, so Jacques uh, scoring two uh, games in a row, so two goals uh, for him in two games, and this one went all the way to the shootout. Uh, it would be uh, Farrell and Maye who would uh, seal the deal and secure the win that way. Laval's record currently 12-14-3-2. That's a .468 points percentage, 24th in the AHL. Yeah, Sean Farrell's heating up with um, the game-deciding goal in, in the shootout. Dobas was terrific in the shootout. Arbor Jackai uh, now has a point streak going in the AHL, uh, his point streak at five games. Um, and and uh, the pairing of, of Arbor Jackai with Logan Mayu. Logan Mayu had two assists on Friday night. Um, uh, is Laval turning things around? They're, they're, uh, they're looking pretty good at this point. Yep, well, they'll certainly have an opportunity uh, to continue their winning streak uh, this coming week. On the 7th, Laval is going to be in Utica before they come back home. On the 10th, uh, Utica is going to visit Laval. And then on the 12th of January, uh, Manitoba comes to visit Laval. So it's a pretty uh, busy week for uh, the Laval Rocket coming up. Three straight games against Utica. Um, two in, in Utica and then back, and then they meet uh, again in Laval and uh, five games against the Utica Comets, Comets in January, uh, which I find the AHL schedulers are um, are a fascinating bunch. I sense a rivalry coming. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and if we want to go uh, one step down the depth chart, uh, let's take a look at the ECHL affiliate of the Montreal Canadiens, the Trois Rivières Lions. A bit of a mixed bag for them this past week. On the 12th of December, or sorry, on the 30th of December, uh, they visit Maine. They come away with a 3-2 to two victory. Then uh, they come back home on the 3rd of January, uh, Adirondack visits, and uh, give them a nice spanking 6-1. to one. And then on the 5th of January, uh, they visit uh, Worcester, where they lose 5-3 to three in the shootout. Uh, currently, Trois Rivières record is 15-15-2-1. That's 8 eighth place in the Eastern Conference. So uh, as we mentioned a few weeks in a row, it seems like uh, their offense is really drying up. They got a little bit back better this week, but still not great. Uh, Ty Smolanik does return to the lineup from injury, which is pretty nice. Uh, leading the way points-wise, it's Anthony uh, Beauregard and uh, Justin Ducharme as they're tied for the team leading points. Yeah, they're getting some players back from uh, Laval, from uh, Ottawa, um, and so the, the scoring has picked up, uh, certainly better, uh, this week than it has been. And we'll see where that carries them next week. Uh, an article we put out, uh, on, uh, thn.com slash QMJHL. If we want to take a look at the Quebec Maritimes Junior Hockey League, uh, Jeremy put out a fantastic article. Uh, it's entitled, How Far is Too Far? Uh, Canadian juniors face online abuse. Uh, what can you tell us about this one, Rick? Well, this was um, this one was in relation to Oliver Bonk. Um, that unfortunate goal where the the the, the puck went off uh, his leg into the net. Oliver Bonk from the London Knights, um, and he had to uh, make his his social media accounts uh, private because he was getting all kinds of abuse. There, there, there was. There's no reason for him to be blamed on the goal. There was no reason for, uh, I get fans upset. Canada, a disappointing uh, showing at the World Juniors. 
uh, but you don't blame it on a young player. And and um, Jeremy uh, did a good job uh, outlining that and also compared it to um, situations, similar situations that have ha- happened in the past. Yeah, so good job to Jeremy on that one. You can find all of our content about Canadians' prospects at THN.com slash Montreal, and you can find the best English language coverage of the Quebec Maritimes Junior Hockey League at THN.com slash QMJHL. We have a couple quotes of the week here, and both of them coming from Montreal-born goaltender Devin Levi, who made his very first start at uh, the Bell Centre on Thursday night. And uh, this first one, he's going to talk about getting ready to play at the Bell Centre. Yeah, that's going to be super special, you know, coming out to fix you. Um, being in that building will be really, really cool. You know, last time I've been in there is probably, I don't know, a while back when I was a kid watching the house game. So um, it'll be cool to be on the other side of it. What stood out in your mind about when Carey Price was the man 10 years ago? He owned the city. Yeah, you know, he was so dominant. Um, and he did it without looking like he was trying. That was the coolest part, I think. So um, he's su- such a good goalie. Um, you know, growing up watching him definitely gave me a lot of inspiration. Really good person also. I had a chance to meet him a few times. So, um, you know, it was uh, really cool to have him as a, as a role model being so close in the city. So um, it was uh, it was definitely special growing up. So we're talking about um, a goaltender from another team. Yes, we are. <laughs> we definitely are. Why are we doing that? Well, um, because he was uh, Devin Levi, 22 years old, born in Born and raised in Montreal, um, and uh, enjoyed going to the to the Bell Center. Enjoyed going to the Bell Center. He said he loved going and booing Zdeno Chera, um, and he loved going uh, to the Bell Center and watching uh, his hero, his inspiration, the the guy who made him want to be a goalie, Carey Price. Um, he talked about uh, still being able to clearly picture all the big glove saves uh, uh, that Carey Price made. Uh, you heard the reporter say, you know, um, what was it like when Carey Price owned this city, owned Montreal? Um, and he talked about, you know, Carey Price was was terrific without even trying, but uh, more so he was a good person. Um, and that was inspiration. So um, lots of, I, I, I found uh, that this was, and this was before the game, um, he was so excited to to play at the Bell Center, um, a place that you know he had been so often as a fan, um, and I I I thought I found it absolutely fascinating. Absolutely, I loved hearing all that from him. So we heard about uh, him getting ready to play at Bell Center. Well, what was his experience like? Oh, it was so fun! Uh, hell of a game by the boys. First of all, um, we played really well. Um, yeah, to be in that building to to beat that team was pretty special. Um, you know, I wouldn't have liked it to go any other way. So, yeah, absolutely excited. Um, he, he said, um, that, that the one thing he normally, um, in his routine, uh, getting ready for a game, uh, he puts on his headphones and he play and before every game he plays, he plays fix you from gold play. Um, uh, and he said, the cool thing about this game is he didn't have to do that. Because he heard it um, in the arena, um, playing in the arena, uh, and that that kind of inspired him. Um, obviously, a, a Canadians fan now um, attached to the Buffalo Sabers. And the interesting thing for me is that you know we always hear about the 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 player that the Canadians miss, the guy from the queue that the that uh, the the guy from our own backyard in Montreal that. Um, that the Canadians mi- missed. I don't remember anyone saying that, any of the reporters saying that about Devin Levi when he was drafted in the seventh round, the 212th pick overall uh, by the Florida Panthers in 2020. Um, and in fact, um, he went, uh, the Canadians had a uh, seventh round pick in 2020. Um, do you remember the controversy there? It was a big controversy in Montreal that the Canadians had not picked a Francophone player, had not picked a player from the queue in 2020. They had a seventh round pick. They traded that pick away to the Chicago Blackhawks and Chicago uh, took that pick and selected um, six foot eight defenseman, Louis Crevier um, of Chicoutimi. 
And and all the reporters said, "Why? Why would you? Why would you do that? Why would you? Why would you trade away? You could have picked uh, Louis Crevier. I, I haven't heard." Louis Crevier um, <laughs> uh, being in the the NHL, uh, but they could the Canadians could have uh, with the 212th pick, um, you know, five to to before the end of the draft could have picked uh, Devin Levi in the seventh round, and nobody was making noise about that at that time. Um, he's excited to be in Montreal. Uh, his, his resume, you know, being a seventh round pick, uh, his resume is, is, um, if you've missed it is, is obviously great. Um, he was a, a goaltender at Northeastern, um, grew up in, in the, the Montreal minor league system, played for Lac- St. Louis Lions as everybody seems to do. Um, and then went to Northeastern in, in the NCAA and was terrific. Um, played for Canada. We were talking about the world juniors. Um, he had a 964 uh, save percentage in the uh, World Juniors. Um, won a gold medal. Um, he's, you know, a, a, ter- a terrific story. It's sad that we're not talking about him as a Montreal Canadian. Nonetheless, for a Montreal-born player, this is a, a wonderful story. Yeah, for sure. Uh, let's take a look at some hockey news from around the NHL and uh, start things off. Uh, well, the sad, sad Ottawa Senators finally had <laughs> their, uh, <laughs> finally put together their group of uh, hockey operations staff. Uh, so in October, uh, GM Pierre Dorian was let go after that scandal involving the Ottawa Senators losing a first uh, round pick uh, one of the next uh, three years. Um, Steve Seos, who was appointed as pre- president of Hockey Ops, uh, was uh, named the interim general manager. And, well, Steve Steos will become the general manager and the president of Hockey Ops. Uh, Dave Poulin will join uh, the team as a senior vice president of Hockey uh, Operations. And Ryan Bonas, uh, who was the assistant general manager, now becomes the associate general manager. Um, I think lots of talk about uh, bolstering that uh, front office from uh, owner uh, Michael Adlauer. Uh, I, I feel like this is kind of a disappointing result. Uh, it's uh, some of the same uh, and adding in uh, Dave Poulin, who's uh, I think I think there's some mixed opinions on him. He does have some experience uh, being in a uh, hockey operations position in Toronto, but uh, yeah, I have to say that uh, this is a little bit disappointing given all the talk about uh, trying to bolster that hockey operations staff. How well did Dave Poulin do in uh, in Toronto when he was there? Um, uh, not I, good. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, for me, um, I'm just, uh, and I know opinions differ, but uh, I won't miss Dave Poulin on the Canadians broadcast. Uh, and so that, for that reason, is a win for for Montreal, I do like um, <laughs> the addition of Ryan Bonus. Of course, his his dad, Rick Bonus, um, head coach of the Winnipeg Jets. But Ryan Bonus, in his own right, um, has got a fair bit of experience uh, with respect to uh, scouting. Um, uh, he scouted uh, with with the Jets, with the, the Penguins, um, and has been involved with both the Ottawa Senators and the and the Belleville Senators for the last few years. So. Um, I like that pick, but yeah, you, you got to wonder about how they're all going to work together and that uh, management crew that they've put together. Yeah, of course. Uh, Michael Ann Lauer, a uh, former stake uh, owner in the Montreal Canadiens, uh, compared uh, Steve Steos and uh, Ryan Bonus to uh, the well, what Montreal has in their front office with uh, Kent Hughes and Jeff Gordon. He's looking for a similar, uh, I guess, collaborative effort there. Um, but uh, kind of crazy to me that uh, this took, what, three months after the firing of uh, Pierre Dorian <laughs> to get this together. And yeah. uh, you have two of the same guys. Uh, uh, no formal formal interview process either. Uh, so I, I don't know. I feel like uh, this is kind of disappointing and uh, just uh, overall sad, sad Ottawa Senators is what I'll keep calling them. All right. Uh, good news for uh, the Montreal Canadiens, I guess, uh, in uh, the uh, 2024 NHL All-Star Game uh, uh, roster was announced, or at least the first selections uh, selected by the NHL, and it's going to be Nick Suzuki for the third year in a row. Um, uh, last year, I believe uh, he uh, took over for Cole Caulfield, who got injured. Um, 
So Nick Suzuki back at it. Be nice to see someone else uh, get involved. Um, the NHL uh, fan vote is now open. So depending on what you're looking to do there, if you're looking to uh, put in a Montreal Canadiens player that uh, might be deserving, you know, there's Cole Caulfield, there's Sean Monaghan, maybe even a Caden Gooley. Uh, but if you're looking for the memes, I think Arbor Jack guy is the guy that you might want to vote for. <laughs> well, it's funny because I saw online that there's a campaign uh, for the fan vote uh, and they're encouraging um, Canadians fans to to vote for Montembeau. Um, Michael Pozzetta and his five assists and uh, Yaris Lavkoski. Uh, with his four goals. So um, <laughs> uh, we'll see if that happens. But when you think about, um, and I think you can vote 10 times a day, something like that. Yeah. Um, sorry, I, I, it's been a while since I've been interested in, in the All-Star game. When you look at the players, uh, of course, everyone has to be represented. One player from each team, 32 players are already in. Uh, they're going to take 44. Is that the, the number? Um, yeah. Uh, so they'll add a, an extra 12 players from the fan vote. And when you look at the exclusions, like Elias uh, Pettersson in, in Vancouver, Anze Kopitar with the Kings, um, William Nylander um, with Toronto, uh, Kale McCarr isn't even at the at the All-Star game yet, although I expect um, he'll uh, be voted in. Um, yeah, I, d- I don't know that uh, Michael Pozzetta is going to be uh, a shoe in for this year's All-Star game. Yeah, for sure. And uh, also, I guess you got to feel bad for Oliver Bjorkstrand having to cancel family vacations to San Francisco, I believe, because <laughs> he was named to the All-Star game. Kind of a interesting choice there out of Seattle. But anyways, if you're interested in the All-Star game, uh, you can go ahead and start voting. Uh, news out of Washington, uh, former Canadians captain Max Pacioretty has debuted uh, with the Capitals this past week. He's played two games, nothing on the score sheet yet, but uh, after all the injuries over the past few seasons, it's actually kind of nice to see him back on the ice. Yeah, the uh, Capitals are, they need scoring, and so that's what Max Pacioretty can do. Um, those those two um, season-ending torn Achilles injuries, uh, it, it it's just... And I know that that um, um, Bergevin created kind of a hostile environment and, and kind of turned fans against Max Pacioretty, but um, he was the captain of the Montreal Canadiens, and it's good to see him at 35 years old um, making a return uh, in a Capitals uh, jersey. And uh, one last thing before we end the segment. Uh, we do have a trade to announce. A trade uh, to announce. down early this morning. Yeah. Uh, to the Chicago Blackhawks, Rem Pitlick, the former uh, Montreal Canadian, <laughs> and to the Pittsburgh Penguins, a seventh round pick. So uh, not a big trade, but uh, it's definitely a Montreal Canadiens connection there. And uh, nice to see. I think that's the first trade of the calendar year, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, uh, come on, uh, Kent Hughes, uh, let's get to work here. You can make some trades uh, pretty soon here. And uh I guess uh, with uh, the announcement of Connor Bedard uh, being injured, uh, Rem Pitlick is kind of the replacement. Oh, I believe yeah. Nick Foligno is also uh, going on uh, injury. So Rem Pitlick, uh, you have some uh, big shoes to fill there. <laughs> yeah, Connor Bedard, fractured jaw. Uh, that incident with um, um, uh, the Devils' Brendan Smith. Uh, and then Foligno went in uh, to try and settle a score. Didn't, uh, broke his... his uh, finger uh, on his left hand so those two on um, IR and um, Chicago needing forwards they thought that maybe Rem Pitlick could fill uh, a void um, and for a seventh round pick and it's um, so I've been a 24 2024 pick it's a 2026 seventh <laughs> round pick so uh, but listen if if Rem Pitlick can be traded Anyone can be traded, so yeah, as you said, can't you? We're, well, well, we're going to be talking about that uh, rather shortly. Yeah, we'll give uh, Kent Hughes uh, a little break here, and then uh, he can make a, a trade in the next <laughs> segment, maybe. Yeah. Uh, but uh, coming up, we'll hear from uh, our sponsors, DraftKings, and then it's uh, the big topic segment, talking depth and injuries. Uh, stay with us. This is the Canadians Connection podcast here on Rocket Sports Radio. Bet the action on the ice with DraftKings Sportsbook. You know, it's hockey season once again, and although I love using DraftKings Sportsbook to I don't know, enhance and make more fun my NFL watching week to week. 
It's even more fun when you get in on the action with the NHL and DraftKings Sportsbook. Uh, whether it's daily fantasy, whether it's uh, same game parlays that you're doing on Sportsbook, or whether you're just placing straight up money line bets, DraftKings Sportsbook makes it fun and easy for you to bet the action on the ice. So download the app now and use code THPN. New customers can get 150 bucks instantly in bonus bets for betting just $5 on hockey. Now that's code THPN only on DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NHL. The crown is yours. Bonus bets expire 168 hours after issuance. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit www.1800gambler.net. In New York, call 877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY-467-369. In Connecticut, help is available for problem gambling. Call 888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org. Please play responsibly. On behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort, 21 plus age varies by jurisdiction. Void in Ontario. Bonus bets expire 168 hours after issuance. See dkng.com slash hockey for eligibility and deposit restrictions, terms, and responsible gaming resources. NHL and the NHL Shield are registered trademarks of the National Hockey League. Copyright NHL 2023. All rights reserved. Welcome back to the Canadians Connection Podcast here on Rocket Sports Radio. I'm Michael Spinella. You can find me on Twitter at the Spinella. With me in the studio is our president and founder of Rocket Sports, Rick Stevens. Make sure to give him a follow on Twitter at Rocket Sports. You can also follow at Haps Connection on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Plus, you can check out the website, CanadiansConnection.fm. And just a little reminder here to make sure you hit that subscribe button. Make sure that you are subscribed to the Canadians Connection podcast in the player or on your favorite podcast app. That way you never miss a single episode. And it's, uh, well, we've entered a new calendar year and uh, a few games away from the halfway point of the Montreal Canadiens uh, season. And uh, once again, injuries are taking a toll on uh, the Montreal Canadiens roster and depth, uh, quickly disappearing once again. This time, no Alex Belziel around to come in and save <laughs> us. Uh, Raphael Harvey Pinard also uh, currently out with an injury. He might come back, though, as we talked about in that first segment. Trade deadline comes up on March the 3rd. How will Jeff? Uh, Gordon and Kent Hughes navigate this trade deadline and the rest of the season with the desired uh, wanting to remain competitive. But uh, also, I kind of want to make them, uh, well, I want to see them make a big splash at the trade deadline. So uh, how do you think this might go about, uh, Rick? Well, it's it's complicated. I, th- I think it's fair to say that it's complicated. Um, we saw that the Canadians uh, over the holidays, uh, prior to the holidays, flirted a little bit with... Um, you know, um, moving up their their money puck playoff prediction uh, to about thirteen percent, still not great, but but um, it gave fans hope that perhaps uh, the Canadians would be, um, you know, uh, maybe it was maybe it was time to make a push for the playoffs. I, you know, I don't think it down to three percent now, uh, and I don't think that this is the year that the Canadians should be doing anything um, to bolster uh, their lineup. Um, I know that online we've seen um, I, I, Canadians fans wanting to make the playoffs, wanting to um, cling to a Sean Monaghan. Uh, David Savard blocks a lot of shots. We need him for our playoff push. I, I saw on in the French media saying that maybe Kent Hughes shouldn't be a seller. Maybe he should be a buyer. And, and with the injury to Dvorak, maybe he should be going out and, and adding a, a third line center at the deadline. Um, yeah, it, it's it's all very short term thinking, and I think that um, you know Jeff Gorton uh, did so with the New York Rangers, uh, accelerated the rebuild, gathered assets, traded some away, brought in players, um, and and I think that's what both he and Kent Hughes are trying to do uh, this this season and and overall for the rebuild and. And I think that's what they should do, uh, and and let's hope that that doesn't um, that they, they don't get distracted uh, temporarily. Um, but how can the Canadians do that? How can they, 
you know, down a down another center, um, uh, Kirby Dock out, uh, Christian Dvorak out, um, Alex Newhook out. How can they? Um, how can they uh, remain competitive for the rest of the season? Um, can they afford to lose a Sean Monahan? Can they afford to lose um, a David Savard? I, I think. I think that they'll be okay. I think that they'll be okay. Uh, and the way we, we figure that out is going through uh, and looking at the lineup, looking how the, the lineup might uh, shake itself out. Um, and then that would, that would make us feel comfortable uh, that they can, that Kent Hughes can fully participate as a seller uh, in the trade dead uh, at the trade deadline. That's only two months away. As you said, trades have already started to happen. And what we don't want to see is what happened last year and that all the, the trade assets uh, get injured and you have to sit out uh, the, the trade deadline. Um, I know that Kent Hughes is a patient guy. I know that he has a certain price in his, in his mind. He's said, you know, holding or, or other GMs have said he's holding players ransom until uh, that, that price is, is uh, met. Um, but we're getting to the point where uh, we'd like to see some movement in order to help this rebuild move along. Absolutely. And first thing, I, I do need to get this out of my system before <laughs> I get to the rest of it. Trade a goalie, please. <laughs> yes. Uh, there's three of them. And yeah, you, you, one of Allen, one of Primo, please just, just get it over with. It's been too long. <laughs> so now that that's out Are of my right system. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. All right. So I, I came up with a few things that uh, Ken Hughes and Jeff Gordon could do if uh, they were concerned about depth. Um, well, uh, something they actually did last season when there were a lot of injuries. Well, they picked up a player off of uh, waivers. Uh, that was Chris Tierney. Uh, expiring contract, cheap. You throw them in uh, your bottom six, doesn't really matter. Uh, there's always a way to get a warm body. Um, also, I mean, one of the things that uh, we've suggested that uh, they both do is uh, retain salary on a player to maximize the value. Well, instead of retaining salary, you could also approach it as in let's take a contract back and uh, maybe that's the warm body that you can have in place uh, to help your depth a little bit, assuming that that is a concern. Also, uh, you're going to look at uh, possibly signing a uh, prospect towards the end of the season. Uh, I think we can uh, discuss who that might be just a little bit later. And of course, uh, looking at something the Laval Rocket did recently, well, they went and signed a free agent goaltender in uh, Kaskazuo, and that really helped their depth as well. So there's there's always ways to get uh, other players into the system. And when you're a rebuilding team, at, I'm, I'd hate to say it, but just a, a warm body to have in place. That's all you really need, right? Yeah. So looking at the lineup, uh, the lineup as it's uh, constructed now, um, you know, who are the players uh, who are your best assets, who other teams might be interested in uh, at the trade deadline? Um, I, I think the first two that just jump off the, the, the lineup page, the roster page, are Sean Monaghan and David Savard. Uh, those are players who can help a playoff-bound team uh, without any question. And uh, those are the skaters and the goaltender is Jake... Uh, is likely Jake Allen who can um, help a playoff bound team. Um, so those those players um, can they can the the lineup uh, sustain the loss of um, of those players without really tanking the season? Um, well, I, I I think um, there's no question that that as you said, the, a goaltender has to be traded. Whether it's Caden Primo, although in that case somebody's going to be looking um, at future value, um, you certainly wouldn't want Caden Primo helping out your play uh, playoff chances. Um, so it's it's Jake Allen who can can help out there. We talked last week. I know the the um, mainstream media is down on Jake Allen, up on Sam Montembeau. If you look at the um, the stats, particularly the advanced stats, it's it's much closer than you think, and and that's what teams will be looking at. Um, it 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 would be fine to to um, move along. Well, more than fine to move along a, a goaltender. 
David Savard, um, yeah, I, I, we know that the Canadians have uh, eight healthy defensemen right now. Um, Jonathan Kovacevic, Gustav Lindstrom aren't yet aren't able to get into the lineup, um, and that's not even talking about uh, what could be brought up from Laval. And we'll we'll talk about that in in a little in a little bit. So. Um, as far as defensemen, you got to kind of clear the way for the young players, uh, move David Savard. Um, my hope would be that Mike Matheson would be on that list too, although he's more of a, uh, off season, uh, trade asset in my mind. Um, and on the forward, um, uh, side trading Sean Monahan. Yes, you're trading a center right now. It's Nick Suzuki. Sean Monahan as the second line center, Jake Evans, uh, he's been in that second line center slot uh, at times, and then Mitchell Stevens. Um, but I think you're you're fine um, uh, trading uh, a Sean Monahan because you have forwards coming back. Raphael Harvey Pinard uh, coming off IR probably this week. Tanner Pearson, who can play center, um, is not that far away. And uh, towards the end of February, don't forget, um, if he's on schedule, if his rehab is on schedule, you have Alex Newhook, um, who's your, your second line center right there. Um, so would it, you know, have fans got attached to Sean Monahan? Of course. Um, but you can't risk uh, Sean Monahan has an injury history. And it was Marty St. Louis this week that said... Um, um, that with the injury to Dvorak, Sean Monaghan is going to have to uh, play on the penalty kill. Um, take, taking, it wants him out there for face-offs, taking left-side face-offs, but he really wants to see Sean Monaghan playing more on the penalty kill. And my heart dropped um, because blocking shots, being in a defensive role, um, <laughs> there's lots of injury potential uh, there and I, I get that you know Monahan likes to play more minutes. He likes the responsibility. Likes taking important um, faceoffs. He's he's a proud player. He, he takes pride in what he does. But uh, there's all sorts of injury potential coming up there. So uh, before that happens, uh, let's see him moved on. And I guess my point is uh, the lineup would be okay um, with moving a couple of players out. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, would they probably take a step back if, if they move on from Sean Monaghan. Probably a little bit, but they could get uh, some uh, help from Laval, uh, of course. Uh, there are a, a few players in there that I think could be worthy of a call-up at some point this season, even if it's towards the end. And, of course, uh, a few prospects that could become available towards the end of the season uh, once their seasons end in uh, their respective leagues. Uh, right now uh, in Laval, you have a Sean Farrell that's had a pretty good season there. He's had a few NHL games last year. Uh, I think at, even if a short stint, it would be nice to see where he's at. Uh, Joshua Wise, I, th- I think that's someone everyone's excited to see at yeah. the NHL at some point. Uh, of course, maybe towards the end of the season, uh, around that trade deadline might actually be a good spot to give him a look for a few games. And uh, one, Leas Anderson. Um I don't know that he's had uh, major contributions in Laval, but he's still a player that uh, he's been around for a while, and uh, I think uh, he could be an interesting call-up for the Montreal Canadiens uh, at some point as well, just to fill in that gap a little bit. Uh, in terms of defensemen, uh, I think everyone's waiting for our, when Arbor Jacki might come back up. Uh, Logan Mayu, uh, the first round pick, uh, he might uh, get a call up at some point. He's been great uh, during his time in Laval. And I think uh, you, Rick, even were uh, expecting him to maybe make the team out of camp at one point. And then uh, William Trudeau, uh, I think he's uh, had good games. He's had bad games, but uh, I I think he's more than deserving of a look at some point. And as per uh, what prospects could be available towards the end of the year, well, Lane Hudson uh, in the NCAA, once his season at the NCAA comes to an end, I think it would be great to have a few looks at him in the NHL now. Yeah, Kent Kent Hughes has already gone on the record and said publicly that they will sign Lane Hudson um, and he'll play with the Canadians at the end of the season once his NCAA season is over. Um, So you you can take that one to the bank. Um, Arbor Jacki, I think it's been a good move and I think, uh, he had a tough time going down. He was, 
Uh, he was a bit bitter. He understands now why he was sent down, and I think it's been very valuable for him to get a lot of minutes. Uh, and the two of them together, Jacai and Mayu, are just a hard pair to play against. Um, and so, yeah, will we th- th- expect Hudson to be added to the mix? Uh, Jacai is knocking on the door, uh, so it really makes sense to um, to, to uh, alleviate some of that uh, logjam. Um, on the defensive side by by um, engaging in some trades, um, whether it's a you know a David Savard, uh, as I said, I don't think it's um, um, uh, Matheson who's going to be uh, traded in season, or and uh, maybe it's a Gustav Lindstrom that uh, has some NHL experience. Looking at the forwards, talking about NHL experience. Leas Anderson has uh, 110 games. He's only 25 years old and 110 games uh, in the NHL. So he he would be no stranger um, to uh, NHL play if he was recalled. And as you said, Sean Farrell had a couple of games at the end of the season last year. So there's all kinds of possibilities um, to fill out your lineup, um, either with those players coming back. We mentioned Newhook, Harvey Pennard, Pearson, Uh, or the players available uh, from Laval um, that should make this a, an active uh, trading season uh, for Kent Hughes and for the Montreal Canadians approaching uh, the deadline. Yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, a call up that you were pretty happy to see was uh, one uh, Mitchell Stevens. Uh, Instead of bringing up a prospect right away, you brought up someone that uh, he's got a little bit of NHL experience, definitely more of an AHL veteran. Uh, I think that did make a lot of sense uh, because at the time, I think the obvious call up would have been, you know, a Joshua Waugh, but uh, keeping him in Laval a little bit longer to develop, I think was very smart. But once you get to the point of the trade deadline, I do believe that that's going to be your opportunity to start bringing up some of those younger guys. Of course, you mentioned Leah Anderson uh, could be a good call up if you still feel like uh, guys like Joshua Wall and Sean Farrell could benefit from more time in Laval. I uh, hate to say it, but I'm wondering if maybe even a Philippe Maillé could end up being a call-up <laughs> just a stopgap for a couple games. He's not a prospect or anything. You know, of course, more of an ECHL guy, but uh, plenty of experience there just to throw into that bottom six at least. Yeah, I, I, I've liked uh, Mitchell Stevens. He's quietly done his job uh, on the fourth line. Um, and yes, as I said at the time, uh, much rather see... Um, Mitchell Stevens uh, playing eight, ten minutes uh, a game rather than bringing up, um, you know, a prospect like Josh, Joshua. And and at the time when we were talking about this, Joshua Waugh wasn't ready for a call up. Uh, he hadn't experienced the ups and downs and the travel and the three and threes and all the uh, the things that uh, go into playing uh, in pro hockey. Um, and he's had his he had a great start. He he got quiet. Um, and he's looked good. Um, especially I liked, uh, I've liked him with, with Sean Farrell. So, um, the, a guy like Mitchell Stevens can come up. He, he's experienced, um, with, uh, with the NHL, 87 games in the, in the NHL, lots of experience over 200 games in the AHL. So he can, uh, fill that gap, um, and not be, not be exposed like a, like a rookie prospect would be. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with that uh, as well. And I just want to also highlight just the logjam that is that defense. I know you listed off all the guys currently on the NHL roster, but uh, you're more than capable of moving along from a David Savard or whoever and not really losing anything, to be completely honest. Even some of the guys uh, that might be your depth pieces, healthy scratches at this point, and Kovacevic and Lindstrom have looked pretty good when they've been in NHL games. I I think those guys absolutely could be moved off to a playoff team looking to bolster their uh, defensive depth as well. And uh, to be honest, uh, credit to all the young Montreal defensemen this season for the way that they've emerged. I think a lot of those guys have looked great and uh, kind of staples on that back end at this point. Justin Barron, who had a a rough uh, uh, preseason training camp, um, but has... Um, you know, and spent some time in, in Laval has, um, looked great, a natural pairing with Caden Gooley. Yeah, they, uh, there's mistakes, but, uh, that's all in, uh, learning. 
Um, Jordan Harris, there's lots of folks online saying, trade Jordan Harris. Uh, he's been great since he's been back uh, since injury, uh, since his injury and paired with uh, Jaden Struble, um, uh, both from Northeastern. Uh, they've looked great together. And, and a lot of this, a lot of the uh, decisions um, have been... Um, you know, made by the fact that Jaden Struble has looked like an NHL defenseman, um, yeah. and and it's allowed them to to spend some time, uh, let um, um, Jack I spend some time uh, in Laval and and uh, and and push a player like Kova Savage, a great waiver pickup, uh, has helped fill the gap, and and then maybe it's his time to move along to help another team. Um, but it's been a player like Struble who's who's uh, uh, f- fought to to keep his spot in and and earned his spot in uh, the Canadians lineup for sure. And uh, one last thing I did uh, want to mention as well: if uh, we're looking to get very creative, uh, assuming if if you are in fact very concerned about depth at uh, forward, we saw the eleven and seven this past week. I know that's not our favorite thing to see, but that's certainly more of a possibility uh, that we could see uh, that coming back uh, towards the end of the season, especially with uh, the amount of solid defenders that we do have and some of those young guys that uh, we just talked about. I know, like like I said, I know that we're not big fans of it, but that's obviously something that I I wouldn't be surprised if we saw that a little bit more uh, as we approach the de- trade deadline, right? Well, and keep in mind that uh, as soon as a goaltender is moved, that opens up another spot uh, for a skater to to be added to the roster, um, and that will allow that will help uh, Marty St. Louis be able to uh, rotate some of his players um, uh, in and out of the lineup that uh, that should help deal with any exits uh, of some of uh, some of those veteran names we've we've already mentioned. For sure. So, uh, Jeff Gordon, Kent Hughes, uh, the time is now. Start to uh, get to work if you haven't already. <laughs> we uh, just highlighted all the things that you could do, all the depth. Uh, so, we're looking forward to this trade deadline. Like I said, March the 3rd is uh, the day uh, that you want to have circled on your calendar. And uh, before we transition into our final break here, uh, Rick, did you have any final comments? Well, it's, uh, as you said, um, a couple of games away from the midpoint in the season, how quickly the season has gone. Um, and I think uh, over the next two months, things are just going to accelerate, especially with all the excitement around uh, the Montreal Canadiens and uh, the upcoming trade deadline. For sure. And uh, I think one last thing I did want to throw out there is uh, I know that uh, the Montreal Canadiens were anticipated to be last place in the Atlantic. They're in fact not. There's two worst teams. And I think that's just how bad those two worst teams have been. <laughs> Buffalo and Ottawa have been awful this year. Uh, so definitely, if you want to look at a successful rebuild, do not do what either of those teams have been doing. Right. And uh, to be honest, I'm curious if at some point that's going to change at all. But uh, credit to Montreal for not being at the basement to, at the Atlantic at this point in the season anyway. For sure. So our Canadians Connection question of the week is uh, which Montreal Canadiens player would you like to see at the All-Star game? Currently, it's just uh, Nick Suzuki, but uh, fan voting is open, so let us know who you would like to see there. And uh, with that, it is time to uh, take our final break. Uh, We'll have uh, the Have Your Say segment coming up pretty soon. Stay with us. This is the Canadians Connection podcast here on Rocket Sports Radio. The Canadians Connection is proud to be a partner of Rocket Sports Media, digital media publishers of sports and entertainment websites. Their mission is to build a worldwide network of sports fans who are informed, engaged, entertained, and connected. Learn more about RSM, its team, and its portfolio of brands at rocketsportsmedia.com. I bet you enjoy sporting your best Habs jerseys, dressing up your kids and pets in the cutest Habs gear, and showing off your decked out hockey cave or fan ink. Well, don't just show your friends, show your Habs. The Rocket Sports Media team wants you to boast your finest pictures for our global network of Montreal Canadiens fans. Include the hashtag ShowYourHabs when posting your fan photos on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. Then log on to showyourhabs.com to see your entries, along with photos and posts from Habs fans all over the world. A proud member of the Rocket Sports Media Network. If you're a business owner looking for the perfect platform to reach a targeted audience of customers, Rocket Sports Media is the solution. 
Our global hockey community provides unmatched social media reach to an attentive demographic of sports and entertainment fans. We can provide visibility to your company, helping you to engage and leverage this prime group of potential clientele. In addition, we also offer sponsorship opportunities for fan events and featured areas of website content, giving you name and logo recognition. Visit rocketsportsmedia.com to contact us regarding this unique marketing opportunity. For the most trusted source of news, analysis, and features about the Montreal Canadiens, log in to thn.com slash Montreal. Your year-round source for anything Habs-related. That's thn.com slash Montreal. Welcome back to episode 277 of the Canadians Connection podcast here on Rocket Sports Radio. You can follow at Habs Connection on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and you can check out the website at canadiansconnection.fm. Also, feel free to text us anytime via the Rocket Sports text line, 5853-ROCKET. That's 5853-ROCKET. And uh, Rick, uh, kind of fun there to go through and talk about uh, depth, uh, maybe an early look at uh, the trade deadline too, and uh, all the various moves that uh, Montreal Canadiens do have in store for uh, when they do start to make some of those bigger trades. And I think that um, some uh, Canadians fans have forgot that there are some players on the sidelines that um, that that could be returning and and could be helpful. There are players in in Laval that could be recalled and could be helpful. Um, so it it's not as dire as one might think um, as we approach the trade deadline or, and are looking to move um, some of the veterans. Absolutely. So at uh, this point in the season, uh, the Montreal Canadiens can be pretty difficult to, to keep track of. Uh, lots of news uh, coming up uh, pretty soon, I'm sure. And, uh, well, here's where you can find everything you need to know from Rocket Sports. Uh, head over to THN.com slash Montreal and you can find all the Canadians coverage in one place. We do game uh, previews, uh, game uh, recaps, plus feature articles throughout the week and uh, extensive coverage on the Laval Rocket and various prospects there. Uh, so make sure you check that out, thn.com slash Montreal. Also, if you like uh, multimedia content, uh, you'll want to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Just search at all Habs and hit that subscribe button so that you never miss a single episode. Throughout the week, uh, Amy Johnson hosts a couple different shows. The first one being the Habs Hockey Report. Uh, the latest episode entitled 2023 NHL S- Statistics and Trends. The results might surprise you. Uh, that's going to be where where you'll find some very good Montreal Canadiens coverage. Amy also loves to interact with all the viewers, so leave a like, leave a comment, uh, ask your questions there, and uh, she loves to hear from everyone. Also, the Rocket Hockey Report, uh, the latest episode entitled Is Laval Poised for a Comeback? Plus, Jack Eye Success. That's where you're going to want to find all your best uh, Laval Rocket uh, coverage. Uh, she does that weekly, uh, so make sure that uh, you check out both of those. Leave your comments, hit the like button, and subscribe. Throughout the week, we also do include the Canadians Connection uh, on that YouTube channel. Uh, the last episode entitled Habs Trade Targets. Uh, you've spoken five uh, New Year's resolutions for uh, fans' demand from the Habs, and uh, that one was hosted by Amy Johnson and Rick Stevens, so you'll make sure that uh, you want to head over there. Uh, that one, we had tons of uh, comments from fans <laughs> uh, and resolutions there, so uh, if you do want to get involved, uh, we love uh, interacting with all our viewers and uh, all of our listeners, so make sure you head over, hit subscribe, leave a comment like I've been saying. Uh, also, coming up this week, uh, we've been uh, doing live stream watch alongs periodically on our YouTube channel. And uh, this week, uh, myself and my colleague uh, Nathan will be doing a uh, live stream watch along for Montreal versus the Philadelphia Flyers on January the 10th. Uh, so we're super excited about that. Uh, we get uh, live questions, uh, live chat uh, in there as well. Uh, I'll uh, host, I'll do some commentary. We'll talk about Montreal Canadiens. We'll talk about the Philadelphia Flyers and uh, make sure that uh, you set your calendar. Tune into that one. And uh, like I say, like and subscribe, but also hit that notification bell. So if you ever uh, want to make sure that uh, you know that we're doing a live stream, you'll get notified with that notification bell. So uh, you don't want to miss out on that. 
No, I got my my calendar circled. Uh, those those are absolutely the best way uh, to watch Canadians games. Uh, you turn down the the broadcast. You go to YouTube um, and fire that up. Uh, both uh, you and Nathan will do a great job. And you're joined by Montreal Canadiens fans from all over the entire world, asking questions, chatting, chatting with each other. Uh, the best way to watch a Canadiens uh, game, if you're a Canadiens fan, is uh, this Wednesday. Go to YouTube. Yeah, I know on uh, Twitter there was some discourse over, uh, I believe, a Sportsnet uh, intermission show. People weren't too happy uh, with uh, the results there. So <laughs> if you're tired of Sportsnet uh, the way the rest of us are, uh, you'll want to tune into our show. We'll uh, give you a little bit of a better uh, intermission show, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> That's uh, YouTube.com slash All Habs. Um, be sure to subscribe. And also make sure that you subscribe to this podcast, the premier Rocket Sports Radio podcast on your favorite podcasting app, The Canadian's Connection. Uh, you can find every single episode at uh, canadiansconnection.fm. We're here every single Saturday, and we are your inside link to the Montreal Canadiens. And uh, Rick, uh, I believe you have a little bit of an announcement to make. I do. Um, some sad news um, in in my world, and uh, my mom passed away this this past week, and uh, she was the spark. She was the energy. She was the humor of our family. My dad was the, the quiet foundation and, and uh, my mom was um, the, the one that, um, that could light up a room. Um, so uh, it's going to be a different uh, Canadians connection uh, next week. Um, we'll be, um, um, I'll be involved in the, the big topic and uh, we're excited to have Russ Cohn. Russ Cohn is um, a prospect as- expert, a draft expert. We had him on uh, when we were doing our, our draft coverage uh, uh, last season. He said, watch out for Delabor Dvorsky. Dvorsky is tearing up the OHL uh, this season. Uh, Russ Cohen from Sportsology is going to be talking about um, the Montreal Canadiens prospects at the World Juniors um, and some draft eligible prospects. Is it too soon to be thinking about the draft and the Montreal Canadiens opportunity to draft uh, maybe in the top 10 uh, again in June. Um, so uh, that's going to be the the big topic segment on Saturday. And Michael, you're going to be uh, uh, doing yeoman's work, uh, doing segment one and three, uh, and it's going to be a great show um, next Saturday, uh, episode 278. So sending you uh, my utmost condolences on your loss. Uh, I'm sure the entire Rocket Sports uh, family is uh, lending you as much support as uh, you need and uh, helping you get through this difficult time. And of course, uh, happy to pitch in whatever way I can to help uh, continue to bring great content on this podcast. That's uh, most appreciated. And and uh, everyone, um, the Rocket Sports team and, and in our extended uh, Canadians uh, community has been uh, terrific. So uh, we uh, have teased a few times that uh, we are a very interactive podcast and we get all sorts of messages throughout the week uh, from our viewers and listeners. And, uh, well, we have some uh, text tweets and emails uh, that we'd like to get through uh, in response to last week uh, talking about uh, resolutions for the Montreal Canadiens. And uh, I'll start uh, this one off. Uh, We got a message from Stephen and uh, Stephen says, here's a resolution to you. Do more podcasts. <laughs> we appreciate that, <laughs> Stephen. Uh, definitely wish we could. <laughs> uh, do more, yeah. Well, obviously he's enjoying them. If um, if he wants us to do more, that was uh, that came via text, the Rocket Sports text line at five eight five three Rockets. So thank you, Stephen. Um, next it, it was one that uh, came via YouTube, and this is uh, TWF Champ O two. Here's my resolution. Get rid of the RBC patch. Of course, he's talking about the advertising patch for the Royal Bank on the Canadians' home jerseys. Uh, There's also, he didn't mention it, there's an Air Canada patch on the away jerseys, but um, doesn't like the advertising. So get rid of the patch. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, talking about that for a second, uh, the Sini Bear patch on the Laval Rocket jersey, awful as well. <laughs> I'd like to see that one go. Uh, crazy to think that the milk on the Toronto Maple Leafs jersey looks actually a little bit better. Looks not bad. 
Uh, coming from uh, Russell, uh, Russell says, uh, I don't get all the focus on Shaq Guy. He's a seventh defenseman at best. So, of course, uh, lots of discourse uh, coming from Arbor Shaq Guy uh, being sent to the AHL for uh, a bit of a stint. Uh, Montreal Canadiens wanted him to go down there, work on a few uh, different things. And, of course, uh, he was a fan favorite, so a lot of fans, I think, have expressed their disappointment in that. The next two comments uh, were made to Facebook, um, and you can find Rocket Sports and the Habs Connection uh, podcast on Facebook. Um, and uh, this comes from Todd, uh, again, like I say, uh, on Facebook. He says, I'm counting down uh, to the days where there's no Gallagher, Armia, and Pazetta in the lineup. Let's be honest. Pazetta is an AHLer anywhere else, and Galley's best years are behind him. Bad contract. Um, so those weren't names that, uh, we mentioned, um, probably cause there's not, uh, trade possibilities for those players, um, in our second segment, but, uh, Todd would like to see, um, the time when those players are no longer in the lineup. Yeah, and the last message comes from Christopher. Christopher says, I pray for a new owner. Idiot Molson remains a simpleton with zero passion for the game. The franchise continues to be his boy toy. It's sad. Uh, so very passionate message coming from Christopher. I do agree. I'm not a huge Molson fan personally, but, uh, you know, it's uh, I, I guess it's some disappointment over uh, Montreal's shortcomings since uh, Jeff uh, Molson has taken over. Yeah, tell us how you really feel, Christopher. Um, but we appreciate your comment and that one, uh, that one coming to Facebook as well. Absolutely. Uh, so we get, uh, like I said, all sorts of messages throughout uh, the week. Uh, please make sure uh, if you have something to say to us, uh, text us the Rocket Sports text line five eight five three Rocket. You can comment on any of our social medias and YouTube. And uh, Rick, we also have an email address if uh, people have something a little bit longer to say. We do, and you can reach us at hello at rocketsportsmedia dot com. So we look forward to hearing from all of you and continuing to hear from all of you. Uh, coming up this next week, uh, the Montreal Canadiens do have three games uh, starting on January the 6th. Tonight on uh, the Saturday, uh, the New York Rangers come to town and visit a few days off before their next game on uh, January 10th, uh, Montreal uh, against the Philadelphia Flyers. Did I uh, say live so, stream? Live stream? Yep, live stream? <laughs> I was about to say it. Head over to our YouTube channel at All Habs. Uh, Nathan and I will uh, take you through that game and uh, looking forward to you uh, joining us on there. And that's actually a back-to-back. On the 11th of uh, January, the San Jose Sharks come to visit the Montreal Canadiens. Uh, so that uh, should be pretty fun as well. So with that, uh, that's going to be a wrap for us today. Thank you all for tuning in and listening. Uh, make sure that you're subscribed to the Canadians Connection podcast on the player or any of your favorite podcasting apps. And share it on social media if you like what you heard today. Enjoy the week. We'll be back here next Saturday, January the 13th for another great episode. Thank you all for listening to the Canadians Connection podcast on Rocket Sports Radio. Click subscribe so you never miss an episode of Canadians Connection. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Rocket Sports. Rocket Sports.